Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to ask that if you have cell phones, you turn them, turn the volume down, turn them off, please, for the comfort of the rest of the people in the audience. Welcome to Chats <clears throat> with Champions, presented by Skidomfa Library and sponsored by the First Bank, Damascata, now celebrating its 150th year anniversary. It's located on Main Street with 16 branches along the coast of Maine. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce our speaker, John Walker, orchardist and apple historian. John grew up in Massachusetts and California, moving to Maine in 1968. He has lived in Palermo on Super Chili Farm. That name maybe he'll explain later. <coughs> He's lived there for the past 42 years, where he and Cammy Watts grow vegetables, woody and herbaceous ornamentals, small fruits, and fruit trees. He co coordinates nursery sales for Fedco, and the Fedco catalog is over on the table if you wish to take one before you leave. And it's the Co-op Seed and Nursery Company in Clinton. His passion is tracking down heirloom fruit varieties, particularly those originating in Maine. He has established Maine Heritage Orchard at the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association and Common Ground in Unity. Eventually, the orchard will be home to 500 or more historic pears and apples. The first 100 apple varieties were planted in April of 2014. John coordinates an annual series of organic orcharding classes at Mofka, the spring seed swap and twig exchange, and the October Great Maine Apple Day. He speaks and teaches in New England, the New England area, regularly year-round, and this is his second visit to Skidonfa Library. Uh, in 2007, he self-published his book, Not Far From the Tree, A Brief History of Apples and the Orchards of Palermo, Maine. And this book is available for purchase after his chat this morning, and John is willing to sign for anyone who would like to purchase the book. Please help me welcome John Bunker this morning. It's uh, a pleasure to be back here at the library uh, and uh, on this gray day. And, uh, and I think that some of us are actually wanting it to rain. Um, we're, we're really in a little drought here right now, so we could use some water. Um, this morning, I'm going to talk about mentors and apprentices. And uh, that might seem like, well, what are mentors and apprentices have to do with apples? And, uh, but I think maybe you'll see. Um, I brought a bunch of my mentors with me today, and uh, I'm going to introduce them uh, as uh, during the next 45 minutes or so. And then we'll have some time for questions. So the, the, uh, the notion of the mentor and the apprentice probably go back as long as there's been people on Earth. And maybe it goes back even beyond before there were people on Earth. Um, but the most famous mentor um, is probably the, the one that had the name mentor, who was, uh, I guess, Athena. I'm not a, an expert in Greek mythology, but I believe that Athena disguised herself as mentor and then uh, advised, and then advised uh, uh, Odysseus' son in the Odyssey, and, and that's where the name Mentor comes from. And the most famous apprentice, or at least my favorite apprentice, was Fred Frederick in The Pirates of Penzance. <laughs> Probably you remember him if you know your Gilbert Sullivan. And he was the one who uh, 
was mistakenly apprenticed to a pie lot. No, a pie rate, not a pie lot. And uh, so he was supposed to be captaining a ship in his apprenticeship and wind up being a pirate. And then not only that, but he was born on February 29th. So that his apprenticeship, instead of going seven years, which is really what a typical apprenticeship of the day went, was going to go an additional 63. Because he wasn't going to turn 21 until something like 1948 or something. And this was back in the 19th century. So anyway, apprentices and mentors. And I think if we, uh, if we were lucky at some point in our lives, uh, we were able to be apprentices. And if we are fortunate uh, at some point, we're able to be mentors. And uh, so I'm going to start with an apple that you should all know about. Um, and that is this apple here. This is the Kavanaugh apple, and uh, it originated, well, we actually don't know where it originated, but we think it originated right here in Nobleboro. Maybe I shouldn't say here in Nobleboro, but nearby in Nobleboro. And uh, everybody knows about James Kavanaugh, or you should. And, uh, and it's interesting because he was, like many of us, um, from away. And, uh, and the apple, as you may know, is also from away. We think of the apple as being something that is, uh, that we just so closely associate with Maine, with New England, with North America. But in fact, the apple original, it originated halfway around the world. Nobody really knows for sure, but we think that it originated in the Tian Shan Mountains in Kazakhstan, where there are forests of apples. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were many more forests. The forests are being cut down, unfortunately. But there are still forests of apples. Not orchards, but forests. And the apple slowly made its way around the world uh, on what we call the Silk Road. Um, it was not called the Silk Road then, but that's what we call it now. And uh, it was a web of trails that went from India and China in the east to Russia and Europe and Egypt in the west. And on the, uh, in the bellies of horses and in the bellies of traders and so forth, the apple went its way all the way from east to west and over to Europe. And then eventually, like James Cavanaugh himself, but somewhat earlier, the, uh, the apple made its way across the Atlantic Ocean. And when it did that, it started out by um, probably being uh, on the ships of Portuguese fishermen and then other fishermen who fished off the main coast and left the apples um, or apple seeds all over all over the, uh, the islands, and then eventually on the mainland. And when the Europeans uh, came, uh, not only you know, landing temporarily on the islands where they set up little fishing you know, outposts, you might say, when they came to the shore and then inland, they brought with them apple seed. Um, and they planted the seed everywhere. Um, Johnny Appleseed was not um, um, unusual. He was doing what everybody was doing, which was planting apples from seed. Now, I don't want to talk the whole talk about James Cavanaugh, the Cavanaugh apple, but it's a great apple, and, and we're doing uh, what we can to bring it back, and you could be too. But, I, but we have other mentors here that... that uh, so, so we could say that, that, that the Kavanaugh apple taught me that it's okay to be from away. You know, it's all right. <laughs> so, uh, it's very important if you're going to understand um, the history of apples in uh, Damascata or New England. Um, 
to understand a tiny bit about the biology of apples. Um, the flower, the apple flower cannot be pollinated by itself. Um, it also can't be pollinated by another, by, from the, with the pollen from another flower of the same variety. So, what that means is that um, if you had a, an island way off the coast of Maine, and you decide you're going to have an orchard, and you planted 100 Macintosh apples, or 100 Kavanaugh, let's say you planted 100 Kavanaugh's because you thought, oh, this is cool, Kavanaugh came from Noble Bar, I'll plant 100 Kavanaugh's on my island, you would get no fruit. Because even though there would be multiple specimens of Kavanaugh, the fact that, that well, and we're going to get into that, that every Kavanaugh is identical would mean that the Kavanaugh, that you would get no fruit. You have to have pollen from some other source. So uh, you have to have, if you're going to have Macintosh, you've got to have a few Cortlands around, or, or if you're going to have Kavanaugh's, you've got to have a few Macintosh, or something. So if you go to a commercial orchard, you'll find a row of Macs, then a row of Cortlands, then a row of Honeycrisp, whatever. You'll find them uh, essentially mixed. You'll find lots of the same variety near one another, but you'll find this mix as well. That's because, simply because of the botany of an apple, it requires someone else around to pollinate it. So, here's my next two mentors. And this is a good example of this. This is, uh, these are sort of dual purpose mentors. This is uh, Alexander, and uh, Alexander is, is uh, particularly interesting to me in the history of apples because uh, his name for the Tsar, um, and uh, it, it was brought over, it was part of that migration of apples from Europe and Russia to the U.S., um, and uh, it came in about 1815 or so, and uh, it came at a time when, when uh, there, was a, there was an attempt to bring hardier varieties to New England. Um, this was done by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. This was before the advent of things like the USDA and land-grant colleges, all that pretty much didn't exist. There was no pomological society. So they brought four apples over from Russia. And um, one of them was this one. Another one was called Duchess. And, uh, and another one, Red Astrakhan. Some of you have heard of Red Astrakhan. These are all Russian apples that were brought over in, in 18, actually, I think 1813. And uh, I tried to find out what, what these uh, apples were called in Russia. Um, and, and the two in particular, um, uh, Duchess and, actually, the full name is Duchess of Oldenburg and Alexander, don't exist in Russia. And so um, I poked around and, and tried to figure out, well, who was Alexander? Well, that was pretty obvious. It was Alexander I who was Tsar at the exact moment that these, at the time when these were being imported. But who was the Duchess of Oldenburg? Well, Oldenburg is, uh, either was or is part of Germany. I think is part of Germany now. And uh, the Duchess of Oldenburg was the Tsar's sister. And so what probably happened, I'm sure this must have been what happened, was they brought over these two apples that had weird Russian names that, that nobody would be able to pronounce. And they thought, okay, we'll name them after the Tsar and his sister. So this is a little, a little, a little snippet of Russian history. You know, who was it? Why was the Duchess of Oldenburg the, the, the sister of the Tsar? Well, of course, that was back when all these uh, uh, kingdoms, I guess they were really, you could call them countries, were more like kingdoms, were all sort of intermarrying for political reasons. Well, anyway, so this was brought over. And what does this apple have to do with this apple here? This is Wolf River. And, um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Wolf River later. But, but this, this, this seed from an Alexander made Wolf River. So this is, this is uh, you know, I was mentioning that, or saying that we need to know from the history of apples that the seeds do not come true. So going back 
to our pollination. Uh, if you have uh, an island and you have a hundred Macintosh trees and you collect all this and you collect, well actually let's, let's go, let's, let's forget about our island and just go to the Macintosh. So we know now that you must have someone else must, must pollinate the Macintosh in order to get fruit. It can be anything. It can be a Cortland, it can be a Kavanaugh, it can be a crab apple. It can be natural fruit of just a seedling that the squirrels planted. The fruit of that Macintosh tree will always be Macintosh, no matter who pollinates it. But the seed is another story. Every seed will be unique. So if you, if you want to become your own plant breeder, you could just go take any apple seeds, plant them, let them grow up into trees, and you would get, if you planted 100 seeds, you'd get 100 new apples that have never been before. So, so that's why we have, and, and actually I could find some specimens of both of these that would look a little more similar, but aside from the color, Red, uh, Wolf River is usually uh, more pink, and Alexander's more red. But also, uh, Alexander, I don't know if you can see, but it has a conic look to it. It's sort of round, but it's sort of a little bit conic. Whereas Wolf River is what we call oblate. And oblate means that it is squished like this. Um, there are also different sizes, but, um, but you can get pretty big Alexanders. Now, this is uh, very similar to all of us in this room, in this, in this regard, that um, your children, if, you're, if you have any children, are not clones of you. They are a combination of you and the mother or the father, depending on which you are. And apples are the same way. This apple, this wolf river, is a combination of one parent, the Alexander, and the other parent. In this case, we don't know the other parent, so uh, we don't know what what the what the other traits in this apple are. But we know that um, we know that it's a combination of Alexander and somebody else. Now, this is really important, absolutely essential in the history of apples, because it meant that wherever people planted seed they got apples that had never been before. And that was what they did when they came to North America. They rarely brought apples, actually apple trees, with them. What they brought were they brought apples and they brought seed. And they planted seed. Now, um, they planted, and, and pretty much everybody who lived anywhere from Maine to Georgia and out to the Mississippi River, planted an apple orchard. Everyone. Now, these were not orchards like we think of today, like if you go to a commercial orchard and there might be 500 trees or maybe even 5,000 trees. These were more like uh, 10 trees or 20 trees, and a big orchard might be 50 trees. That would be a really big orchard. These were orchards for people's own use. They were for um, they were for cider, for vinegar, for animal food, and then occasionally um, they would get one of these seedlings because they were all seedlings. And, and by the way, as I said, this is going on all throughout the eastern U.S., all throughout Maine. And um, so there were actually millions of orchards planted and tens of millions of seedlings. And so. Um, this was really, in a way, the greatest breeding project that humans have ever undertaken and was all done by amateurs. This was done by people on their own farms. So this had nothing to do with any, uh, any kind of uh, organized system or government or colleges or cooperative extensions. In fact, all that stuff didn't even exist. It was all done by individuals planting seeds and then selecting what they liked. And when they did, when they found something they liked, it might be something like, well, like 
is. This is this is Roxbury Russet, and uh, this this apple is probably the first named American apple, and uh, it was discovered in a uh, seedling orchard in Roxbury, Massachusetts, and. Uh, you know, we don't think of Roxbury, Massachusetts as being a bastion of agriculture, but of course it was, and, um, and it was incorporated the same year as Boston and Dorchester. And, um, and one of the things, one of the ways that these apples mentor me is that um, they teach me all about American history as well. One of the fun things about, about uh, Roxbury is, you know, um, for the longest time, in order to get to Boston, you had to go through Roxbury because there were no bridges. And so there was a, a big road that went through Roxbury into Boston, and that was called Orange Street. And um, right after George Washington uh, uh, was um, left office, and um, he did this big tour of, of America on horseback. And, uh, and of course that meant, you know, the East, the East Coast and New England. And, uh, and everywhere he went, people named things Washington this, Washington that, because of this sort of, you know, post-presidential tour that he took. Well, he got to Roxbury, and so they changed the name of, of Orange Street to Washington Street. And if you know Roxbury at all, you know that is the big street through, through Roxbury. And if you think about it, it is the street that goes to Boston. Of course, now there's all those bridges as well. And also, so if you know your Boston subway system, well, where's the Orange Line? Well, the Orange Line is, goes through Roxbury. And why was it called the Orange Line? It had to be because, uh, because once there was this street long ago, 200 years ago, that was Orange Street. Well, this is Roxbury Russet. And um, it is, uh, by today's standards, or maybe by uh, mid-20th century standards, it is, it is an ugly apple. I tend to think it's beautiful because uh, um, maybe my eyes see past the, I don't know, primary colors or whatever it is that we thought we wanted apples to look like. It is also uh, an excellent keeping apple, storage apple. And one of the things about apples that's so great is if you select the, the right variety, the appropriate variety, then you can pick them right before it gets too cold, and that would be about, we'll say, 26 degrees or so. And, uh, and then you can put them, if, again, if you select the right variety, you can put them in your basement in a root cellar, which is a, which is a room of high humidity. So, 80% if you can do it, and low temperatures, but not freezing, so 34 degrees. And this apple will be delicious in April. And um, six months after you, after you uh, pick it. Now today, um, recently, there was an article that, um, that was uh, in, in the various papers about the um, the stuff that they spray on apples out west in order to make them store for way longer than they would. For example, even though these apples look rather similar, the Kavanaugh will be mush around uh, January. And um, but the Roxbury West, as I said, still be delicious in April. And Wolf River, the same thing. So, so unfortunately, what we have done with the kind of agricultural system we've created, this sort of commodity system where people want to have a gala or a honey crisp or whatever they want to have, they want to have it year round. We take these apples that don't want to spend all winter in a cold basement. They want to return to nature and become compost. Um, we take those and we spray them with something so that they'll pretend to be still good in April when in fact they might look pretty good but taste awful. So, uh, so we could, we could uh, you know, people say, well, well, um, well, what should we do about, you know, these varieties because we want to, we want to eat them in April. Well, actually, if you just pick slightly different varieties, there are dozens of apples that will keep magnificently all winter long 
in cold storage without any fancy chemicals or whatever. So anyway, Roxbury recipe. Okay, so my mentors. So, uh, so one thing led to another, and before long, people were naming apples all over the eastern U.S. and all over Maine, and um, and they were like folk songs. Now, the reason, uh, the way they were like folk songs is this: that these apples were not really being sold anymore. They were, they were being maybe a little bit of local commerce. But basically, these were small, uh, small diversified subsistence farms that wanted this food that they would produce themselves. And then, uh, and then they would store it themselves. They would process it. They would also dry it and so forth. But, but they'd keep it in root cells, you know, and so forth. They wanted food year-round. And most of them had no access to stores. Hannaford's was still about. 150 years away, and uh, and so um, and so, over time, an apple would be would be discovered by someone. This has a great quality. It makes a good pie. It makes good sauce. It makes good cider. It keeps all winter. It ripens in July. Something, whatever it is, and then it would get a name, and uh, and it would get a name in one place. That might be something like, uh, we'll say, the Damascata Suite. And then, and then, um, and then people would, would say, oh, I want that too. And you would say, uh, and you have the Damascata Suite in your head, your yard, because you just gave it that name, because it's a sweet apple and it's from Damascata. And so you said, well, here, you can have some seeds. And you say, oh, no, I don't want the seeds, because the seeds, of course, will not come true. I want the Damascata Suite. So, so that's where grafting comes in. And so when you graft, you take a little piece of the Damascata Suite, or Macintosh or whatever, that's about that big, actually a little, a little smaller than that, but about that big, of new wood. Uh, so, so it would be uh, the, fresh, the fresh wood of the tree. And uh, the fresh wood of the tree, uh, um, is, uh, is also uh, an important thing to, uh, to think about when we think about apples because it's on that new wood that the fruit comes. And um, I was visiting a woman about a year ago who had some old trees and, and, uh, and she, was, uh, she was sort of a philosopher, you might say, of, uh, a homespun philosopher. I'd never met her before. And she, uh, she said, you know, I love the new wood on the apples. And I love cutting out, pruning out the dead wood. Because she says, that's where all of our best thinking is, is on our fresh wood. On our, you know, we talk about cleaning out the dead wood and that sort of thing. Well, the same thing is true with apples. The new wood is the site where the fruit buds are going to come. It's also what you graft with. So you take a little piece of your Macintosh or whatever it is, Kavanaugh, and you splice that onto an existing apple tree that has roots on it. And that is your graft. From that junction on, so you can pretend that my hand is a little apple tree. There's my, my hand is the roots and my elbow is and here's the tree. And you stick on that, you stick on the, it's called a scion, S-C-I-O-N. And from that junction on, <coughs> You have the variety, the Macintosh, the Damascata Suite, whatever you want. And so um, some Einstein of uh, a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago invented this thing called grafting. And how he or she invented it, no one will ever know. It's long, long gone in the past, that information. But anyway. Um, it works. It's a mir it seems like a miracle, and I, I really think it's like a miracle. But going back to our commercial orchard, the first Macintosh apple that ever was was from a seed. Every subsequent Macintosh apple that ever was was from a graft. And that's why you can't have a, an orchard of Macintosh and get fruit. You must have somebody else mixed in to provide the pollen. Because every Macintosh is a clone of of one another. Um, 
So, so people began grafting, and they had known about grafting before they came, before Europeans came to the States, but, um, but it was not widely practiced. They had too many other things going on. They had to bring their axes and their, you know, all their different tools and all the stuff that they needed in order to live uh, in, in New England, and they did not have space to bring trees with them, so they brought apple seeds. But then, over time, they began to graft, and they began to name and graft. And so the apple here, that was called the Damascot Sweet, well, by the time it got up to Jefferson, it might have been called the Bunker Hill. And then by the time it got to Somerville, it might have been called, you know, uh, Smith's Apple. And by the time it got to, you see what I'm saying, and that's what they were like folk songs that um, if you go down south and there's these old folk songs and you go to Tennessee and they have one set of lyrics and you go to Kentucky and there's another set of lyrics but you can tell, you know what, this is the same song. Well, all over the place this was going on with apples. The apples were being passed around like, uh, like kids pass around mixed tapes of, uh, on CDs or something. And uh, people weren't selling them, they were just passing them. They were just flooding the world with these named varieties. And, and uh, uh, by around the Civil War or so, um, there were, we don't know for sure, but we think around 25 to 30,000 named American varieties. So even naming would have had somewhere around 1,000. But nobody knows. That's largely because there were so many synonyms, you know, so many apples that had multiple names in multiple locations. Also, I should say, each area had its own local favorites. So, you would go to one area, and you would get these 10 or 20 varieties would be grown in this community. Up in Palermo, where I live in Waldo County, we have our own, I go, I spent a lot of time in the old orchards there, and I find certain, a certain mix of varieties, some of them some of them probably originated in Waldo County, but most of them from other places, but they came in, they did well there, and so they were grown there. Uh, or maybe who knows why they came there. I mean, in some cases, an apple came to a place because somebody went to visit a relative in some other area and came back with an apple, and then it became established in that community. But anyway, all, all over the place. Now, I was mentioning the Civil War, and, and, um, and uh, so I wanted to mention this apple. Um, and also we were talking about, I was talking about names, and this is one of the most curiously named of all apples. This is the Northern Spy. And, um, and so why, why would an apple be called the Northern Spy, and what is it about the Northern Spy? Well, one of the things that, um, uh, talking about mentors, is um, um, we have we have three daughters, and um, and uh, we have no grandchildren yet. All three of our daughters are approaching thirty, and uh, we're like we're like you know, yeah, you know, come on. But but uh, I've learned to be patient, and um, and why am I talking about this with the northern spot? We'll get to that. But um, but when when our daughters were in their early teens. We were maybe vaguely dreaming of grandchildren sometime off in the future, but we were not hoping for grandchildren then. We wanted to, we wanted them to get a good start in life and a good education, blah, blah, blah. We thought, okay, someday, you know, we'll get grandchildren. Well, the Northern Spy um, is a notoriously sort of late bloomer. And uh, one of the things that people ask me um, when, uh, when, you know, because I sell trees, and I sell these old trees for various reasons that I'll talk about. Um, they they want to know, the first question is, when is it going to fruit? You know, that's like, you know, of all the questions that I've been asked, I've been doing this now for 30 plus years, probably half the questions are that question. You know, when people open their mouth and they say, I have just one question, I, I more or less know that that's going to be the question. Well. Northern spies are, as I said, notoriously late bloomers. So 
they, um, they can go 10 or even 12 years before you get a fruit. And, um, and people, some, the other thing that people say to me is when they come up and they see a display on doing something, they say, well, I'm not going to plant an apple tree because I won't live long enough to see it, to see the fruit. You know, I'm already, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. Well, um, well, there's, there's, uh, I understand why someone might say that. But um, there are reasons why, um, why we would want to plant them. And, um, and uh, I've been talking about, about uh, these uh, as my mentors. And, uh, and you know, I can pick on them and smile. One of the things that I um, came to uh, realize was that um, my mentors were not going to be around forever unless I did something about it. And uh, uh, as I got into these old trees, um, I began to undergo a search for the old varieties that were grown traditionally in Maine. That became sort of my life passion. And, uh, and a lot of them are still here. You can find really old, old trees in almost every community in Maine. We're very fortunate in that regard. If you go to Massachusetts, most of them have been cut down. But, uh, but here, there's a lot still here. But they're going fast. And every year we lose some of them because the road gets widened, or because uh, a new house gets put in, or the tree just finally succumbs. They'll grow to be 200 years old under the right conditions. Hollow, broken down, but they'll still grow. And if they're pruned, then they put on new wood and they fruit. But, um, but still, uh, it, it, it occurred to me that, um, that what the trees from which I picked apples were a gift to me from someone who not only didn't know me, but never even knew that I would exist. And yet, I was able to go out and, and all of these trees uh, or all these varieties are an example of that, and go find these old varieties and, and pick from these very old trees. And somebody had done that for me. Now, did they pick apples off those trees too, many, many years ago, generations ago? I don't know. Maybe they did. Maybe they were lucky enough to. Or maybe they didn't. But, but they did it. And, uh, and so, in a sense, they were... Uh, they were giving a gift to me, even though these weren't my trees. These were, but, but in a sense, they were my trees because I would stop and knock on the house door of the house, and the people would let me pick the fruit. But also, um, uh, so so a gift, a gift to us. And and one day I went and stopped at somebody's house, and uh, and, and usually I would knock on the door, and they would say, you know, oh, you know. Yeah, you take all the apples, it's fine. And one day I went to the, to the door and knocked, and that old man came to the door. And I said, you know, I see you have old apples, you have all these apples on your tree, could I help them? And he said, no. And I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> but I was so shocked. And, uh, but then I started thinking, you know, and here was this guy, and he was being very, he was very friendly. Um, and, uh, and I thought, hmm, this is, this is interesting. What is this about? And he took me out, and he had grafted that tree. And he was still using the fruit. And so he took me into his bar and showed me his little grafting kit. And he had done it with wax and so forth, the way they did it in the old days. And uh, that really inspired me at that moment to learn to graft myself and to begin to plant these. And to begin to do this thing, what I do, this Bedco catalog, where we sell unusual apple varieties, and some of them are common ones as well. And, um, uh, and it also eventually led me to begin to put together this heritage orchard at Mavka in Unity, where we are collecting the uh, historic varieties from all over Maine, all 16 counties, and, uh, and then preserving them for future generations. But let's go back to the Northern Spy. So, the Northern Spy. So why was it called the Northern Spy? Well, um, 
we all uh, have some version of the Civil War in our, in our brains, and that they're all probably sort of vaguely similar. But anyway, uh, there, were, there, there was a series of novels um, written in the mid-19th century about a man named the Northern Spy. And, uh, and we speculate that the apple was named after this man. And the apple, the, the, the apple, uh, the man, may have been real and may have not been real. Nobody knows for sure. And he may be based on, the, the character may be based on a real life figure. But what he would do is he would go down and I have a, a, PDF, a PDF that I got from a library in the South of one of these books. And what he would do is he would go down to the South and visit plantations and pretend to be a, uh, a slave catcher. And he would gain access to the slaves and then he would teach them about the uh, Underground Railroad. And, um, um, and, and that, was, that was his was sort of his thing, and if you know your main history at all, you know that the, that Maine played an absolutely essential role in in funneling uh, slaves, freed slaves, or you know, escaped slaves up to uh, up to Canada, and um, uh, the Quakers, and you know, Brunswick. There's a lot of stuff there. But anyway, that, that's the northern spot. Um, uh, so. Okay. So we don't have a lot of time, and I could just, you could tell I could babble on forever about this stuff. <laughs> so I'll just try to make it a little shorter. These two apples are called sweet apples. This is pound sweet, Tolman sweet. These are both bitter apples. This is Yarlington Mill, and this is Davenant. These two apples are, are, were grown in Maine, but they're from, and there's a, in their English varieties of are mm -hmm. relatively recently. So we have two bitter apples and two sweet apples. So, so uh, you know, life, of course, is, can be bitter and it can be sweet. And, uh, and if it's all bitter, that's not necessarily a good thing. You might know somebody who's always bitter. I hope not. And, uh, you might know somebody who's always sweet, and in some ways that's almost worse than always being bitter. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, the bitter apples, these bitter apples, um, are essential to making really good cider. And, uh, and because if you know, if you know your beer, beer has hops in it. And the hops adds, well, the hops originally was a preservative, right? It, it was what they put into India Pale Ale, which was the beer that they fed the sailors as they went to India. So hops is a really important part of beer. Well, there's no, they don't put hops in cider. Now I'm talking fermented cider. So with cider, all the, all the, all the uh, ingredients come from the apples themselves. And so a really skilled cider maker will, will add the bitterness um, by selecting apple varieties that have bitterness in them. But not all bitterness. It, it has to have some sweetness too because, you, because it is the sugar that is converted to alcohol in the fermentation process. So, um, so so really, when you, when you take you know, a little bit of sweetness and a little bit of bitterness and you put it together, you can get something really quite delicious, which is um, some of these, you know, now there's this sort of craft cider industry that's beginning to develop. And, um, and, the, and a lot of the cider tastes like soda pop now if you buy fermented cider, but, but, uh, but over time, more interesting ciders, interesting flavors like you know, better wine or craft beer or something are being developed, and they're being developed by by uh, by combining combining the bitter and the sweet. So so life can be bitter and life can be sweet. This is called ginger gold, and uh, and it is not a bad apple. It's a very modern apple. You know, you know, we used to have apples called things like, one of my favorite apples is an old Connecticut apple called Hurlbutt. 
<laughs> they don't name apples hurled by it anymore. They name them honey crisp and sugar crisp and sweetie crisp and crispy crisp and ginger gold and so forth. So this apple, um, I mean, I don't want to pick on this apple, but I have a feeling that it was selected because it's beautiful. And it also is crisp and sweet and sugary and juicy. So this is like, um, uh, I would say, uh, um, you know, the old adage, beauty's only skin deep. So, so now this apple here, this is, a, this is a, an, old, an old apple, uh, an old variety that probably originally originated in Massachusetts, but it was grown in central Maine. And this is from an exceedingly old tree in North Belgrade. And this is spice sweet. And, um, and so uh, um, we could also say, uh, you know, you, you, with, with this, it's, it's some of these adages, they, they're flip sides of the same coin. So you have beauty's only skin deep, and then you have you can't judge your book by its cover. So this apple here, um, we, we were told by some old timers in Belgrade that this made the best pie there, there is. And so, uh, and so we, we, do a, uh, we do sort of a pie contest uh, at, a, at a gathering of friends every fall. And, and it's, it is, happens to be coincidentally in Belgrade. And so uh, I thought this year, we're going to we do three or four single variety pies. And everybody gets a little piece, and then we all vote. And there's about 40 people there. And it's just fun, friends. So I thought, OK, I'm going to go get some spice sweets and try it and see how it fares in our contest. So I went to the old tree and picked about eight or ten spice sweets. And uh, my wife, Cammie, helps me make the pies. And uh, we make them that day. And this is it's, it's, it's a fun occasion. So we cut it open. And she tried it. And she said, that thing is so bland. It has no flavor at all. Don't even use it. Don't even make a pie. Up. You're wasting one of our pies in the contest. And I said, no, no, we've got to try this. Yeah. So we made a pie. We made four pies with the same ingredients and so forth. And it won. And, uh, and everybody loved the pie. And you just, so, you know, when I say, you know, you can't judge the book by the cover or whatever, you can taste an apple. You can even eat an apple. You just don't know. Why were these grown? These were not grown as a dessert fruit, you know, fresh eating. These were grown because somebody, you know, 200 years ago, whatever, had this seedling in their seedling orchard and then said, okay, let's make a pie out of that. And then they went, oh, wow, this is awesome. So you can have this totally bland apple. So next time you meet someone that looks a little bland, <laughs> you never know. You never know. <laughs> now, these, these two apples, here's an apple that, that just looks absolutely perfect. It has no insect damage. It has no disease. Same with this one. This is just... You know, it's like, wow, this is perfect. I mean, they're small, but, but, you know, these are perfect apples. Well, these are both from, these are both seedlings. They're from seed. They're just, uh, uh, you know, now remember going back that, um, that every seed is unique. So these are just random, unique seedlings. So as we travel around, we do this, you could imagine, we have, this is a drop in the bucket of what we have at home now. We have hundreds of bags already of apples in our root cellar that we're supposed to be identifying, looking at, and tasting, and everything. And every once in a while, we'll be out and about, and we'll find one that's obviously a seedling, and, and, but it looks beautiful, and so we collectible fruit just, just for the fun of it. And, um, and one of the things about... Um, about apples that is also very instructive from a mentor point of view is that um, often when I'm out and about, I'll find an, a tree by the side of the road in the woods that has never received any care at all, has never been pruned, has never been fertilized, has never been tended at all, and yet it's producing fantastic fruit. 
And friends of mine who do this kind of work have found, found that same apple, so to speak, where, somewhere where they live. And so the immediate thought is, wow, I just found the one super duper uh, disease resistant, insect resistant apple in the world. This is awesome. So they take a little piece of their handkerchief and tie it around the branch, come back in the winter to collect the side wood. That's when you collect those little, you know, the little twigs. And, uh, and then graft it in their own orchard. And then a few years later it fruits and oops, it gets all the same insects and disease and everything else as, um, as uh, the ones in their orchard. So what's going on? So uh, from this, what I take away uh, is that apples respond to the environment in which they find themselves. And of course the same is true with us, with our children and with pretty much the entire world. We're all responding to the environment in which we find ourselves. And um, something, you know, something about where this apple was grown was just right. Some mix of the, of the herbaceous plants and uh, soil and, uh, and the, the, the sort of polyculture, you might call it, rather than monoculture, um, just just create that perfect environment for this apple. Now, part of part of uh, of uh, a good a good apple is the genetics. You know, so here we have Wolf River. Now, Wolf River is not the tastiest apple, but it makes a fantastic baked apple. And if you've ever uh, if you've ever wanted to make a real good baked apple, get Wolf Rivers because you can bake it and the, and the skin will not collapse. So, so it all stays right together and just makes a wonderful dessert. Well, this, this has good genetics, but this, but this is, you know, what is that expression, nature or nurture or something like that? So here's, here's nature and here's nurture. Now, now they're different, but, but both have wonderful qualities. And that leads me to the, um, to the heritage orchard that we're working on. Um, at the heritage orchard, we're trying to do both. We're finding the genetics, the nature, so to speak, and, um, and collecting these old varieties. And, um, and maybe you know of a really old tree or two or an old orchard. And the ones that I'm really looking for and have been looking for are the ones that look like this. They're big, they're hollow, they're broken down, um, and they look like, uh, they, well, they look like, uh, I like to think that they're just patiently waiting for someone to come along and care again. And uh, these trees, sometimes that you can find a tree that's this big and only 10 feet tall, because the whole top is rotten and broken off, but they're still alive. Sometimes you can find them, like one I found out in Bremen oh, a year or two ago, is about like this big and about 60 feet tall and probably dates from when the farm was. It was a saltwater farm and a saltwater farm when the farm first originated. But, um, so we've been collecting these varieties and um, we've planted about 100 of them so far in this orchard and we have another 200 in our nursery waiting to be planted in the next couple of years. And, um, but, how are we planting them? And, uh, and is that as important? So is the nurture part as important as the nature part? And I think it is. So what we're doing in this orchard is we are planting it not as a monoculture, not like apples on a lawn, but we're planting hundreds of companion plants, you might say, remember the old companion plants, in and amongst the apples to create a, an environment that the apples will love. Um, and, and if you need to duck out, go right ahead. If anybody needs to leave, I'm sorry, I'm going a little late here. I'll try to go just a couple of more minutes. So, um, so we're creating habitat for pollinators and for beneficial insects. Um, you know, as, as uh, people are having more problems with honeybees, well, there's a lot of native bees, and we need to be creating habitat for those native bees. And uh, also, some plants, and we're, 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 we we planted this orchard in a gravel pit, so we're we're um, we're teaching.
teaching people and teaching ourselves, how do you renovate land that has been abused in the past? And also, how do you create a mixed environment that, the, that will be conducive to healthy plants? And so some of the plants we're planting there, besides the apples, actually improve the soil by being there. They're deeply rooted, they bring up minerals, and then their leaves uh, lay down and rot and, and create the humus and the organic matter for the future, and so forth and so on. So, um, so uh, let's see if I missed anybody over here. I think I got them all. Um, um, So, um, so I like to think of the apple as being um, sort of a sort of a time machine that that I can go back, I can pick up an apple like Roxbury Russet and then dive into the history of Boston and the hub and the Red Sox and all that, <laughs> or I can look at um, what's going on right now in my orchard and. Um, the spice sweet and just makes such a great pie, and here we are, we need a pie, and isn't that great? Or the future, and, and it's sort of a crystal ball looking into the future. And what I like to think is that by, um, by letting these apples be our mentors and our teachers, and you can say that about probably any plant, but it's fun to do it with apples, then we can learn how it is that we might be able to have um, a really successful and wonderful uh, local agriculture for the future. So uh, I can ask potential questions if you want. We'll take a few minutes if you have questions. John. Have a question? Sure. Are any of the seeds patented, like in like wheat seeds, end up mm -hmm. being patented so you have to pay Monsanto um, if you want them? Yeah. Does that happen? Does any of the I'm not, I'm not sure if any seeds are patented yet, but I know that different varieties of apples are patented. So, so, um, and that has been a big change, you know, um, and that during the period of, you know, which is most of our history and most of the history of apples, new varieties were simply thrust into the public domain. So they became the, the property of everybody. And um, as we have struggled with how to pay for plant breeding programs in the future, uh, basically what's happened is the, uh, the few university programs that are still doing any breeding have turned to plant patenting. And um, so it's, it's unfortunately, um, for whatever reason, we, that's really been what, what has been happening. So most of your very new varieties, Honeycrisp, Sweet Tango, Jazz, these sort of things, that you would see in the grocery store now, they are pretty much all patented. I have a question about grafting, because could you end up having different kinds of apples on the same tree? Absolutely. So, so um, in, uh, before we did this orchard at Mafka, the repository where I was saving all these old varieties I was coming, coming up with was at my place. And so I have trees, because I don't have that much space, and because I'm not an orchardist, I'm a preservationist, I would have a, one tree with 10 or 12 varieties on it. And what, would, what that would allow me to do is if I came to your house and you had a really old tree, I could take a piece of cyanwood, bring it home, and at least save it by getting it onto a branch at my place. That way, if your tree died, I would, I would have it. And then I could actually take cyanwood from that branch and make more trees that could go back to your community or, you know, whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. I just brought some apples. There's a dilapidated orchard. They're not very old. I don't think it's probably uh, more than 80 years old. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. I'll look at them afterwards. Thank you. Oh, okay. You can stick around and we'll look at them together. Um, Are there any other questions? Any, one, one or two more questions? Yeah. And the coast where we have the heavy clay soil, uh, what do you do to renovate? Compost and gypsum or Yeah, yeah. Um, you can, you know, any way that you can break up the soil at least a little bit um, if you have heavy clay. But you can also you can also build your apple, you can plant your apples in basically a hill on top of the clay. 
so you can put compost down and some better, you know, some broken up clay and maybe some other soil and so forth, and then build it up and then mulch around it, and so that eventually, and the mulch, the, the effect of the mulch and compost, wood chips, anything, seaweed, will break up that clay and the roots will go down into it. So, uh, one more. Yeah. What about pruning? When do you prune take out the... When you take off the dead wood? Well, just like for us, we should take off our dead wood anytime. But, and really that's the same as with, with apples. Is if you have dead wood on your apple trees, prune it anytime. But if you're going to do more than that, if you're going to, um, to really do a pruning on, your, on, your, on any fruit tree, with one exception, I'll talk about that in a second, but you would do that when the tree is dormant. So most pruning, is, with the exception of dead wood, is done um, from, say, New Year's to April 1st. And um, the one exception would be peaches, and they like to be pruned later, like around May, after they've leafed out. But basically, you, the rule of thumb is you would prune your trees when they're dormant. Okay, one more, yeah. To what extent do you uh, sort of inventory the apples of Monhegan? Because there's a ton of apples, for um, I've, I've been out to Monhegan a couple of times and seen, and seen some of the trees, and I have friends out there who sort of occasionally will send me, send me trees, send me fruit. But, um, but I haven't done a really careful inventory. There's, there's, um, there's, uh, there's people out there that I, are you from out there? No, it's not. Oh, okay, because yeah, I could put you in touch. If you were interested, I could put you in touch with people. Okay, yeah, okay, well, so um, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna stick around for a little while. I'll look at these apples and I'm happy to answer questions if you want one of our catalogs or if you're interested in more in the Heritage Orchard, you've got a little hand out there. And um, I do have copies of my book. And um, also, the people here at the library can put you in touch with me if you want to be in touch with me sometime else. Um, and, um, um, and keep a lookout for those old apple trees because uh, that old, ancient, broken down tree that you see might be something that would just uh, really deserves to be saved for the future generations. And, and be a mentor. Okay, thanks.